hey, and whatever question you want to ask, ask it. Ask it while we're in here because I think we're going to dinner afterwards and I don't want to miss out on my sandwich or whatever we're going to eat because I'm sitting there answering questions that you can ask during the class time. So anything, sometimes folks say, well, I didn't want to ask this question in front of the class because this is a, it's kind of a stupid question. There's no, there's no such thing. It's, um, you know, all the questions that fit into those categories are those that remain unanswered because you're afraid to ask. And, you know, we're musicians, so everything for us is kind of objective. Whatever you see and however you perceive it is not wrong. I'm just here to share with you some of my thoughts, and that's all they are. They're just simply thoughts. But I've been, been doing that for a little while, and I'm happy to talk with you all about anything. So, questions. Yes, sir. When you write or arrange, what do you focus on or look for? When I write or arrange, what yeah. do I focus on and look for? It depends on what it's for. I've written many different types of um, music. I've mostly been working in my career in jazz, and that's what most um, folks know me as in my professional musicianship, as a jazz musician. But I've written for concert choirs, gospel choirs, orchestras, trombone ensembles, brass quintets, brass bands. Um, and so what I focus on, it depends on what I'm writing and why, you know. Um, the last writing project I had um, was a, most recent rather, was a project called Prince and Clay, and it was in um, Charleston, South Carolina. A friend of mine that took had trombone lessons from me uh, a few years ago, worked for this company, and they were getting ready to feature this classical vocalist that wanted to do a program of spirituals and hymns and that kind of thing. And she'd been on some of my programs, and she said, you're the first person that came to mind. Would you like to do it? I said, of course. Another chance to write and publish some music. And um, I met with a vocalist. Her name is Janae Bridges, and she's not um, Kathleen Battle famous or uh, Frederica von Stata famous, uh, well known yet, but she will be. And uh, we met, talked about some tunes, some concepts, and then the um, theater, they wanted me to write a new piece for the project called Prince and Clay. And what it was uh, about, this guy had done this project on slave dwellings, and the, the Prince and Clay was the name of, um, uh, something that he had written because he noticed that there were fingerprints in the clay from the people that made bricks. But when he put his hands up to it, he saw that they were really small. So that told him that children were slaves you know, during, during, during that um, time as well. And it was like, wow. You know, and I read that. So I got to compose a piece, uh, you know, about something that's near and dear to all of us in one way, shape, or form in, in America, just dealing with our history. And it's like, so I always want to write something that um, uh, kind of um, it has, you know, has has some kind of meaning, and that to me meant a lot. It had to do with my upbringing. I'm a jazz musician, but I grew up in um, uh, church. My father played classical piano, and um, he studied classical piano, but he didn't go the route where he wanted to go to Carnegie Hall and all of that. He stayed home and. We're from Waynesboro, Georgia, and um, he played classical piano, he studied at home, tried to get us to do that when um, we were younger, but as boys growing up in the country, you're sitting at the piano going, dong, dong, ding, dong, dong, hey, throw the ball, dong, dong, you hear the other boys outside playing like that, and I don't, I don't really want to do this. <laughs> and he didn't, he didn't make us take lessons. As a matter of fact, my older brother's here, say hello to Lucius. Um, He's living, out, he's living out here now, and anyway, he started playing trombone, which was really what started me to playing the uh, trombone. I really wanted to play drums, but my mom, parents, they were like, absolutely not. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm, it, all of it's kind of connected. So the opportunity to write a piece about something so, <coughs> excuse me, so significant was, I, I, I love it. And I was like, man, how can I tell the story? So I began to read the guys, re, you know, read up about the Slave Dwelling Project. And then Janae, she sang classical music. And I wanted, and, and she'd also dabbled in gospel. And I had my quintet. So we had a choir and, you know, 
when, when I get a, an opportunity to compose, I like the freedom to be able to write whatever it is that I'm hearing. I love, you know, voices. So if I get a choir, um, I would love to have a choir or, you know, train voices. And we used a the choir there. We had, um, the, you know, Janae, uh, my band. And we put together, had to put together a program. They, they um, commissioned me to write one piece and I took advantage of it and wrote two. I said, no, I want to premiere two pieces. Why are you gonna write two pieces? I don't pay you to do one. I said it's not about that. It's like this is no music that I'll have to publish, you know, later. So when I'm writing, the subject matter is, you know, what um, what you know what what I kind of focus on. So if I'm writing a dance piece, um, like swing dance, I'm thinking about dance. And like I was talking to you guys about playing, everything you play music is some kind of dance. You see the music from the '30s and '40s. You look at their charts, like our charts we have now, it didn't say quarter note equals 120. It said waltz. It said foxtrot. And you, and you knew what those tempos were, but what were those? They're dances. You know, walk, you know, a, a waltz is a dance, and a waltz would just be played at a certain tempo. So then we started getting swing, uh, you know, swing dances and, and all of those um, that came into with the integration of everybody coming into America and jazz music, it was just like, wow, you know, music really about, you know, freedom, the freedom to express, you know, y yourself and to play, say what you want to say, you know. I tell people all the time, we jazz musicians, we wake up trying to solve problems every day. How am I going to approach these chord changes? How am I going to deal with that tempo? How am I going to, you know, you know, fight with the, with the trombone. Trombone is my main instrument. I play 20 other instruments, but, and it's not the first one that I would go to. The first one I, I would go to is the piano. How many people in here are music majors? Just about everybody. How many play piano? Yes. What if, if you don't? Piano is the one instrument that will help you um, develop your musical intelligence at a much more you know, rapid rate. All, all great jazz musicians, they can play piano. Some play well enough, you know, like Dizzy Gillespie, they can play gigs on the piano. But um, they can sit down and play through chords, you know what I'm talking about. Um, doesn't matter what instrument they play. And all the colleagues that I've worked with over the years, you know, they do play piano. So, but you know, you'd have to ask me project by project. I've done, thanks. I look like I need two, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> Another um, project I had that premiered in 2000, I got to write for an Oscar Me Show film. People in Lincoln Center, they want to celebrate the centennial of the birth of Paul Robeson. And I, I guess he must have been born in 1900. And uh, the New York Film Society and Jazz in Lincoln Center, they wanted to celebrate it by writing, um, maybe having someone to compose a score to his first uh, film project on on um, his first project on film. You know, he did the Body and Soul by Oscar Michaud. Came out in 1925. Um, that was Oscar, uh, not Oscar Michaud, Paul Robeson's debut as an actor on film. And you know, you see all the, the modern, modern technology they have with film. <coughs> Excuse me, now, and um, Oscar Michaud was just way ahead of his time. You know, you see Eddie Murphy playing and then he professor three or four people and Paul Robeson back then, he, he was playing um, two people. Now they didn't have the technology to put them on the screen at the same time. But it was, it was like, oh, it was a compelling film. Why? It was shot in Georgia. The story kind of took place in Georgia. It's about this preacher. He's an ex-con um, who escaped prison. And he went, um, got away and he ran off uh, posing as a preacher, but you know, and he was a, a, a minister of the cloth to these people in this rural town in Georgia. But then he was like drinking and womanizing and we know preachers don't do that. So, and I'm, I'm not I'm not picking, but it's like, it's just, it was a story, it was a, a fiction, and it was like, wow, man, this is just close to, you know, my childhood. You know, I grew up in Georgia, I grew up in church. So to tell that story, and it was the first time for me because growing up, you know, down south, you know, on the um, east coast, it was uh, difficult sometimes because people said there was two kinds of music, the sacred and the secular. 
But or in our church they said there's God music and the devil's music or Satan's music. And I was like, and anything that wasn't church music was Satan's music. And I was like, it was I was kind of at a conundrum because I started listening to jazz. I was like, man, I don't know. Satan got some pretty good music. <laughs> You know, I don't think I want to go to hell, but if that's what they're playing down there, I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to find out that, you know, that's just, you know, way, way that uh, people believe in, you know, the reason where you're from and all of that. And then, and I kind of grew out of that. But that was my first one. And then we premiered in New York in 2000 and performed it a couple other times. And then we performed at the Lucas Theater. And, Someone asked, say, have you seen Ostomy Show's film Within Our Gates? I said, no, I heard about it. It was his response to D.W. Griffith's uh, Birth of a Nation, which was an epic film, but it portrayed African Americans kind of savage, and it was just like, wow, and it was a celebrated film, and Ostomy Show wanted to do something. I heard about the film, but I never watched it. And the guy that was uh, curating at the Lucas said to me, he said, uh, yeah, you should write, you should write the score to that. I said, I'd love to. If somebody paid for it, I'd be happy to do it. And then he sent me a copy of the film, and I watched the film, and I was like, wow, wait a minute. I watched it another two or three times. And then, like, weeks later, it's just interesting how things happen. People from Jazzmobile in New York called me. They said, why, because we want to do a project with you. You got anything you want to do? We want to write a grant. I said, well, I just got this film from Oscar Me Show Film within our gates. Yeah, we know it. I said, I like, I think I'd like to write a film score for that, you know, for a live big band playing with the, while the movie's showing. They got the grant, and I just, I started writing. Matter of fact, your, your, your teacher here, Mr. Chris Johnson, has been my copy for a long time. He saved me many times in terms of getting, you know, if I have a deadline, he said, don't worry about it, I'm on it. And I said, hey, and you know, and he, he, copied, he copied that score for me. And I was, I think that was my first, well, it wasn't my first large score, <clears throat> but it was the first large score that only one person copied. When I did Body and Soda, I had about four or five people copy. Chris copied that by himself. It was about 2,800 measures, and um, he got it to me, and it was just like, man, just publish already. I'm like, man, I feel like I'm big time. But we performed it in New York, August the 26th, 2011. The next time was April 5th in uh, 2013. And the last time was at the Savannah Music Festival, I think, in 2015 or 16. It's a very, very compelling film. It's a silent film, but it deals with issues that were prevalent then that are still prevalent. And um, so I just kind of get into it, uh, look at the scene, and just try to tell my side of the story musically. Like one time the city of Columbus, um, Ohio, they want to celebrate 200 years of the, no, that was the second thing. They wanted to celebrate this, this area in the city. And you know, I'm kind of fascinated, even though I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I'm an avid reader, I'm reading every day. But if something captivates me, um, I kind of get into it. And there was this neighborhood uh, section of town, I think Eisenhower may have been president, when they start building interstates throughout the United, throughout the United States, there was a, this um, prominent neighborhood in Columbus where every, you know, it, this was, you know, during, you know, racial segregation. And of course, where did they build the interstates and where the cheapest property was? Where was that where the African American folks lived? And in that neighborhood, they had everything. They needed, had their own bank, they had the dry cleaners, barbershop. Everything they didn't really have to need, and it was an affluent neighborhood. But that's where the interstates came from. It kind of broke it up, and um, they called it the. They had different segments of neighborhoods, the Blackberry Patch, and somebody had come in and they they sang Body and Soul, and they, and they saw me writing that, and they came to the performance. So would you want to write something about this? It was a three-year project. I said, Yeah, sure. Now, of course, I'm from Georgia, and. There are lots of great musicians from um, Ohio, and maybe in the Columbus area. And of course, there was a little opposition. Was like, why are you going to get an outside composer? I said, I don't have to do it. I was just I was asked to do it. I didn't ask to do it. But the thing is, as I started to work, we worked with the people in elementary schools, the high school. We involved the community, and it was like a really and, and even the teachers. Like on that teachers' day, we would meet our fly-in and over um, two and a half, three-year period and to tell this story of this neighborhood. 
with, you know, with the photos, some of the photographers, some of the people were still living, the artists <coughs> that were there. And I found that as I started doing it, because I was doing it for the Jazz Arts Group, which um, is who the uh, Columbus Jazz Orchestra is, you know, managed by. Some people had problems with that, like in the African American neighborhoods. Well, it was, you know, and then you start getting into politics. And I said, well, you know, the lady that called me to do it, I said, Judy, I'm happy to do this. I said, I don't have to do it. But the thing you're going to get from me is an unbiased opinion. I don't live here. So I don't have to play politics with the mayor or with, uh, you know, this side and that side. And I was shocked because some of the people I had become friends with, they were like, oh, I think I'm going to step off. They kind of stepped off. I said, okay, well, I really want your input so I can, you know, put in, in the um, story. They came to the performance. We had it two nights, and they really, really dug it. So I like, um, I guess, you know, profound material. Um, and it doesn't have to be something that's epically uh, long, you know, like the song that um, we were doing, some of the songs we were doing, the duets between Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald, they're just great. You know, one of my one of my favorite duets, Pops is one of the greatest influences on me uh, <clears throat> as an individual, not just because of his playing, but just, you know, just humanitarian he was. I mean, you know, Duke gave him one of the greatest compliments. He said, you, Louis Armstrong, came from nothing, gained everything in the world, and never heard of anybody along the way. I was like, wow, you know, I don't know if y'all know the, anything about Louis Armstrong other than him being a trumpet player, but he did make a lot of money. His manager said to him in the uh, twilight years of his life, you made all this money, get out of the city, come build you a mansion out here on Long Island. It pops like a mansion on Long Island and get away from these people, what do you mean? I love my, the, the kids, my little ice cream eating barbershop, people in his neighborhood. He was, you know, no matter, <laughs> no matter how much money he made, he just stayed, he kept his feet on the ground. And, you know, that's kind of, that's the kind of influence that, that, you know, I like. You can, you, you, can, you can do many things, but at the end of the day, we're all still together. You didn't ask me that, but I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> any other question? I promise I won't give an answer that long. Yes? Can you give any advice on like finding your own sound and being successful on the trombone? Can I give advice on finding your own sound and being successful on the trombone? You already have your own sound. You want to develop your sound? That's where the, that's where the work comes in. Um, today, things are really great in that you can find information quick. I remember I was teaching at Michigan State. Let me have been before Mr. Johnson came, and one of the students asked me. They said, "Yeah, these these exercises are good. These etudes are good, and you know that's good. But what's the shortcut?" I said, "The shortcut, the one, you know, just being able to play." I said, "The shortcut is the straightest line between where you're standing and the practice room." So <laughs> even though technology has allowed us to get information quick, the process for doing this. You have your own sound already. You want to develop your sound? I have a question for you. How often do you practice? Um, Sit again. As much as I can. As much as you can is not a good answer. Give me a day. Give me a definite answer. As much as you can could be ten hours a day. Probably around four hours a day. Four hours a day? That's a lot of time. What are you practicing on? Um, I, I do my fundamentals and then move on to whatever music I'm playing in the ensembles I'm playing in. Mm -hmm. Well, you have, a, you have a nice sound when you're playing. Maybe I can take more time to get towards what you're working on. I need to see you play, um, see what you're doing when you're going into the upper register. I can tell in the whole trombone section, you all don't utilize your alternate position, so you're doing a little more work than you have to. And, um, you know, things like that we can talk about. Um, have you trans, have you, who do you listen to? Um, I, You listen to J.J. Johnson? Cool. Have you transcribed any of his solos? Uh, Old Devil Moon. Old Devil Moon? So you can play that on a trombone? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, then answer with confidence. I'm just asking you questions. I'm not trying to trip you up anything. What about uh, Laura? I haven't transcribed that. 
Yeah, there, there's certain, and I'll be glad Mr. Johnson has my information. I'll, I'll just send it to you. Uh, you want to learn how to develop your own, your own sound, you have to do what the masters did. They said a good one's borrow, great one's steal. It's like, <laughs> it would be nothing to see Sonny Rollins down at the Village Vanguard on the wall while John Coltrane is playing. Or even a great master like Duke Ellington going up to Harlem to listen to the stride piano players, everybody from Fats Waller to James B. Johnson to uh, you know Willie the Lion Smith, they just had places where they would hang, and they would all go get inf information you know um, from each other. But they would listen to each other, and and um, everybody, everyone had their own thing. I, I was teaching at Juilliard and had a student that graduated in the classical department, but he always wanted to be in jazz. And then he came over, he auditioned, and got into the jazz department. But I was kind of on my way out, like, it was like 2007, 2008 <clears throat> was my last year. And I, I said, okay, what do you want to work on for his first lesson? He said, I want to work on A, B, C, and D. I said, okay, cool. I want you to transcribe these solos. Um, and I want you to start on these solos. J.J. Johnson, Laura, um, and, uh, and I gave him something else. and, and uh, Dickie Wells, so I always, I always say J.J. because the trombone players, because in order to transcribe successfully a J.J. Johnson solo, you have to have a certain level of mastery of the trombone. He plays so clean, it sound, doesn't even sound like he's playing the slide, so that's why I would do that. But before I could finish talking, he said, well, you know, Professor Gordon, I don't really want to sound like J.J. Johnson. I said, you don't have to worry about that too much. <laughs> you're not, not, not going to sound like J.J., but if you try to sound like J.J., if you try to sound like Curtis, like Jack T. Garden, if you learn their solos, you're going to get some place in music that, you know, that's their voice. So that's what I mean by you have, you have your, your voice already. You just have to decide how you want to develop it. You want to play jazz, you want to play classical. Oh, oops. This will be a sound check. Oh, okay. But you decide what it is you want to do and then work towards that. <coughs> but it takes consistent practice and, you know, and knowing what to practice. And we can talk. You're on the concert tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We'll have a good gig or whatever you all are about to do. Thank you. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so what advice would you give young musicians to simply just be more professional, how to really take that step and developing yourself. Um, how to be more professional? And, and like develop, uh, how, to, how to become, how to carry yourself, like really how to solidify. Well, professional, professionalism, um, being a professional musician, it's just going to be understood that you can play. Mm -hmm. That's just giving, because if you can't, then you probably wouldn't get many places that you're going to go. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, simple things that we learn like showing up on time, um, the best thing that you can have or develop is a good attitude. There's nothing like being in a band or any kind of situation, people whose attitudes are just, you know, they're, they can play, but they're mad about something. <laughs> they, like, you know, they, I'm like, man, dang, what? Ah. Uh, you know, so your attitude about practicing, your attitude about playing, your attitude about getting to the gig, your attitude about just dealing with people. You know, because playing music, for me, it's fun to play with the band, but only if the band's playing with me. I'm not using the band to, to, um, to accompany me. You know, that's kind of what it looks like, but I'm listening to everything that's happening when I'm playing. So whether it's a big band or even if it's a small combo, everybody's input is, 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 is equally important to the outcome of the performance. So uh, knowing that, you know, being a professional, those are simple things. I try to encourage students, and I'm a student of the music, to learn the business. It's a music business. And this is where a lot of us get caught up. I told people, now you don't pay me to, um, you know, play music. I play music for free. You pay me to leave home. So, you know, you know, you know what I mean? Um, yes, this is something that I would do for absolutely nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, 
you have to live. I mean, I have kids. You know, I have, I've lived a very interesting life. And life on the road is, you know, it's, 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 um, it's no joke, but it, it can be, it can be a, a very interesting life, but you have to know, you know, what it is that you want. Talk with musicians, you know. There are a lot of, there are many great musicians that, that are not well known because they simply made the choice to stay home and not go on the road. They're not well known. Doesn't mean that they're not great musicians, it's just that I'm, you know. So in, in your profession, I tell my students all the time, exploit every avenue of your mu musicianship. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You play trumpet. Mm -hmm. You do finale. It's like Mr. Johnson, he does finale. He does all my scores. I tried to hire two of my sons to do that. I'm like, I'm going to give you some work so you don't even have to leave home. You don't have to go punch in somebody else's clock to give them something where they can learn to just kind of work, get into the entrepreneurial uh, spirit and work for themselves. And I had one, one son, he's 30 now, another one, he's 28. And I hey, I don't really want to do it. They want to do something else. I said, oh, okay. You know, I always had uh, Chris, and I had someone else before, you know, Mr. Johnson, that is. And, and, um, and then I had my one son that went to Spain, and he started out painting, like, we need some copy work, because I write a lot of music. And then and, and he was started, he, and then I said, I want you to transcribe some stuff. All of it wasn't jazz. I have a funk band too. I said, and then he got the way he started, mm, him and the horn, and um, you know, I don't really want to, you know, I, he started telling me what he wanted to do. I'm like, I'm paying you. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you don't, you don't have to do it. And then one time I, I needed something, and then I, every now and then, you just, you check people out. And I said, um, I need this by Friday at five o'clock. Um, and of course he was in Spain uh, studying at the Berkeley program, and when it came five o'clock his time, he didn't have it. Five o'clock my time, I didn't have it. I didn't really need it. I just wanted to see if he was gonna do the work. But uh, and the thing was, actually, because Chris had done it already, I just I wanted to see if he's gonna if he's gonna do it. He said, "Well, you know," and he started with, "Well, you know, we're six hours ahead," and I was like, "Mm-hmm." Mm -hmm. And he, he kind of had excuses. Um, he had he had his you know, reasons, I said, I said, that's cool. Being dependable, that's very, you know, very, very important. And they know that if I hire you, that you're gonna come and you're gonna come, you're gonna come and you're gonna take care of, you know, a business, musically and otherwise. Like with my band now, they're gonna talk about silly stuff all day long. But when it comes time to get on the bandstand, I know that they're gonna, that they're gonna be ready before we go on stage. They're like, hey man, let's, let, you know, let's go and do it. So, um, and you know, you just want to you wanna present yourself. Normally, I'd have maybe like a dress shirt on, but I forgot I was coming to Utah because I was in Vancouver last week, and it was hot, so I said, it must be hot in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Not. So anyway, but I will be dressed uh, properly last night, uh, tomorrow night. And you know, you present yourself for the job that you want. If you're trying to get to where you want to be, you carry yourself, you know, that way. You prepare yourself um, that way. And, um, you know, you strive for those things. Find people that did those things. Ask them how, you know, they got there. Playing, um, being able to play at a high level. When you, I'll give you an example. We're all music students. How many of us know the student uh, Giant Steps? Raise your hand. Heard that before? Is it a difficult tune? And now uh, talk to me. Is it? Yeah. <clears throat> Why? And tell me. And you can, first of all, you can't give it. If you say yes or no, your answer is right because it's based on your perspective. Like I said, we're musicians. We put a piece of art on the wall, and what I see, I see. What you see is what you see, and it's still what's in the paint. So whoever said yes, give me two or three answers. Why that tune is difficult? Yes. Yeah, it's changing keys. It's changing keys. Cool, that's good. What else? Yes? Uh, it's really fast. It's really fast? Okay, cool. What else? Anyone else? I heard more than, why it's fast? Change keys? Yes, ma'am. It doesn't hit calls very often, but it's actually... <coughs> I'm sorry, say it again? I said it doesn't hit calls very often, so I have less experience playing with the band than other standards. Ah, those are all great answers. Good. Well, I said we wake up every day trying to solve problems, so let's solve the problem. Doesn't get called that often. No, nah, no, it doesn't. 
<laughs> Why? Because it's hard, it's fast. Giant steps is not fast. You're music majors, yes? You know all your major scales? So that's all giant steps is major and minor scales. You know, it, some people said it changes keys a lot. It's fast. No, it's not. John Coltrane got us. That tune was a ballad. It's slow. <laughs> There's no such thing as a fast song. Who, know, who learned how to run by running first? You had to learn how to walk. And then get cool, you get comfortable walking, then you develop your cool walk, then you have to learn how to run and jog, <laughs> then you develop your cool run, then you have to learn how to, it's a matter of being familiar. It's only three key centers. We have what, 12 keys? So after four keys, you cover, you cover all of those. Fast is not fast. John Coltrane practiced between, um, I think, nine and 11 hours every day. Charlie Parker practiced between 11 and 14 hours every day. So when you practice like that, um, you know, it's going to be, uh, you become very familiar with things. Tempos, you got tempo. You know, playing fast, tonguing fast. When you practice that much, things that seem difficult, they're not, they're not difficult. You watch Charlie Parker play, it doesn't even look like he's moving and all kind of, Fire is coming out of his horn. Same thing with Coltrane. But fast, solution. Slow it down. Giant steps is not fast. Um, you know all your major skills. You got to the other thing. Somebody said something about the key sections. Who knows the melody? Yes. The first four notes of the melody make what kind of a chord? Uh, a major chord. Well, sorry. Uh, Mikey's key major. So. You play trumpet? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a G, G major, uh, G major seven. And I like to talk about singing. See, I feel like if you sing something, you can you can train yourself to play it. If you sing it accurately and in tune, that means you've internalized it. So it's a G major seven chord. So. And if you sit to the piano, which is why I ask, ask everyone who plays piano, you'll see the 2 5 1 motion in all of that. It's just John Coltrane was slick. But if you sit down and you break it down, it's all basic music. It's not difficult. I used to think it was hard. I'm like, man, whoo, man, he's playing that fast. Well, maybe if I practice between 9 and 11 hours a day for two or three years, and I can tell you what. I ain't gonna do it. I haven't done. It. Ain't gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I can tell you that. <laughs> I'll practice a lot, but I, I'm not gonna practice. I had not practice like that. Not going to. However, the, the, the music is there, and if you know the, your basics in music, then you know you got it. You have it. I know we're getting close to the time. I, I do want to share one thing with you all before I leave. Any other questions? Though? Yes. You play a lot of instruments very well. What are the what precipitated you wanting to do? Yeah, no, I, I know. No, not at the same time, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Once you, I mean, once you learn the mechanics of an instrument, the music is in you. And, you know, I talk about singing, 
all the time. That's what I do more than anything um, else. Not like a singer singing, but if I want to work on something. manipulate this instrument so I'm getting better. You know, not like just playing the trombone, yeah. Trombone is an instrument, it's a piece of metal. Trumpet, you know, same thing. But what you're developing is yourself. Um, there was one other question over here. I'll take it before I play this thing for you. Yes. Um, yeah, so um, I just wanted to know uh, who's your favorite musician or group of musicians to play with and why? I guess additionally What makes musicians fun to play with is their attitude, you know, about music. It doesn't really matter um, your, I mean, you know, your ability does matter, um, but it's your, your attitude about playing. You know, I have some friends, I've been playing with a lot of musicians over the years, and there's certain, certain situations I don't want to put my friends in, because some of my musician friends, they're a little finicky and, you know, I want to know who's playing this. And so I said, I called you for the gig. I don't ask you who's playing in your band when you call me. And it's like, <laughs> so, and, and, and you know, but yeah, you have that to deal with. I mean, out here, it's just things that happen in the world. There could be naysayers. I have musicians that were, I was uh, fortunate. Some musicians were always uh, supportive of me, but then I had those. And you know, some of them are still living. They, I, they were cool as long as I was in New York and the new kid on the block. Until I started getting gigs, like at the Village Vanguard, it's like, I can't get no gigs at the Village Vanguard. Then they you know, just started dogging me. And it's like, you're going you're gonna, you're gonna, to you're gonna run into that. You have to be prepared for that. Because for whatever reason, you know, it may just happen. Somebody, they, 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 they don't like something. And the thing is, it's like, man, how do you deal with that? I, I remember one time, he came into a gig. My son was playing in New York. He ended up Magnificent trombone player, by the way, and he was. Um, this cat came in, and I'm a big dude. He, you know, he didn't speak. I'm like, you know, we're both professionals, and I feel. And I was like, I said, you know what? I'm gonna call him out. And you know, my wife at that time, she said, I oh, don't stoop to the last. I'm gonna stoop. I said, I'm tired of being a nice guy. I'm just, and next time I get on stage. I'm going to say, come, any tune, any key, any tempo, and let's get at it. You can stop talking about me to our colleagues and to my students. I was in students to this cat, and, and, and um, before I did it, um, something happened. I wanted to down me the water, and he called me, and I looked at my phone, and I said, I said, no. I started pinching myself. I said, he, he not calling me to congratulate me. And I said, you know, and then it... Some kind of way, music always makes stuff kind of cool. I don't know what it, what it was that happened to him, but and it was still hard to deal with the fact that for 10 or 15 years, he just talked trash about me. Once I um, did my first record, 
um, bone structure with Ron Westry, mm -hmm. good buddy of mine, and I was just like, man, why? I said, why? There's enough room out here for all of us to play. Why you have to spend? And, and, and you know, and I really don't want to be around those people. I've hired some folks. Sometimes they come in. And she, I had this young drummer one time, and he was talking about Fred Wesley. He said, "Man, you know, Fred Wesley. He, he not a bopper, man. He not a bopper." I said, "He's Fred Wesley. What you talking about? <laughs> He's Fred Wesley. He never forgot more music than you might learn the rest of your life. What are you talking about? He not a bopper, man." I said, "Dude." Said, he was young. I know, known him since he was six. Growing up in church, I said, try not to be one of those people that's going to go around talking about negative, uh, you know, negative stuff. You know, if you you don't have to always say what it is that you feel. And then I took him with me on a gig, and he went around some of my colleagues. And then he was doing that with about one of our colleagues. I said, dude, you about to make it where nobody's going to hire you. And it started with me because I haven't hired him since. <laughs> and I'm like, I, you know, it's just. Your attitude about playing, that can take you so, so far. You know, and one of my favorite uh, groups, I went in our side of the It was my formative years. I left college and I went on the road and I grew. Ooh, that was a, it was a steep learning curve. Because they could play. They had mastered their instruments so much better than I. And I had to go back and do what? Basics. <laughs> lip flexibilities, long tones. I had to go back and do all that basic stuff. And I said, so, um, but um, when we play, we're on the road at the height of that, that, that band. We're on the road about 275, 300 days out of the year, which is a lot and treacherous on family life. <coughs> but it was before Cats and the band that started getting married. Anyway, somebody would, all, would, would play, and every now and then somebody would walk off stage and say, oh man, I'm sorry, man, you gotta forgive me how I sounded tonight. I'm like, what are you talking about? It was killing. And that's when you hear something, and you go for it, and you don't quite get it, and you think you fumbled your way through it, and everybody has nights like that. Then there's the nights when somebody just goes for it, and it's like, man, they just step off from their highest point and they still fly. Like, man, West, that was killing time. When? Sorry, you know, I can't search the web on Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> They're watching. They're listening. Um, so, but the most profound for me was even close to 300 days out of here on the road was when it would happen with the old man. And um, there, there's no feeling like that because nine times out of ten it was never recorded. But the band would be playing at such a high level that when you everybody, it's just like, you know, they, they come to the come to the gig, everybody would be clean. And it's just like, you know, and our thing back then was, you know, tires. You got the newest, latest tires. When it came time to play, man, it was just like, and when I got to where I could kind of keep up, then we had those nights where the band was playing at a level musically that was so high, it felt like your feet weren't even touching the ground. Oh man, we get on a bus that night to go to the next city. It was like, man, it happened. You know, it happened again. <laughs> I was like, wow. It's like, man, you always want to get back to that. It's like, you know, and you and um, as a teacher, you want to try to give that um, that understanding or that level of appreciation for that to your students, and then let them know that they can reach that because it's like. Man, whoa, you can communicate on this level. And, um, you know, and it's, it's just, it's just um, magic. So, you know, when you get a chance to feel that, and it, it, and it happens sometimes when you're playing with people for a while and you, you know, you get to know, you get to know one another. But I think that was my most profound experience, and I think, and I have had great experiences with my own band playing as uh, guest artists. I love coming to uh, college and the universities because, you know, I've had some of my students when I was teaching at Julia, they said, um, I want to play, I don't want to teach. Because you'll hear some of my colleagues say, those who can play, play. Those who can teach. That's baloney. Now, I'm, I like baloney, but it's not the good baloney. It's, it's, it's not true. In order to inspire your students, I think you have to be able to demonstrate something that's gonna, you know, you know, as a teacher, so I'm like, I don't fall for that. That's that's um, BS, a bologna sandwich. <laughs> um, because I love teaching, 
and I always learn something new when I when I meet and I play with different students and go in different places. You know, Mr. Johnson um, brought me here, and he was a student of mine at Michigan State back in 2001, 2002. He got caught me one year full time, and then I did that next year. Um, you know, and to see him come, you know, full circle, and he's teaching and doing a jazz studies uh, program here at the university is like, you know, playing with the Count Basie Orchestra, writing a Grammy nominated record of arrangement with somebody. And you know that, that person I was talking about earlier, some people that are just jealous, I'm like, man, yeah, I dig that. You know, I you know, like, like to see, um, like to see our, our students and each other doing well. It's like when you get up on um, stage, people want you to sound good. So I wanna, I wanna share this with you. I'm like, oh man, I gotta take some of those crabs or something in my throat. But this thing is uh, somebody talking about Louis Armstrong, and it's kind of, I think my approach um, to music, or as uh, it has become, and it's about you know seven minutes, but I was teaching at University of Scranton, and students were talking about, what do you do when you get nervous? So they had a, um, you know, they had a medical school there, and they had someone that came to talk about what happens to you physically and physiologically, what happens when you get nervous, and how your palms may sweat, and what causes this. From that standpoint, and then um, my friend shared this with me, and got telling the story about Blue Armstrong, and I'll play this, and I'll be um, done. But I play for students all the time because they're like, "Why you play music?" Like for the applause, when one of the band saying it doesn't stop up here. It had, it has, I kept pointing to the back. And I was kind of, when I was talking to the trombone players, and I was talking about sound, you want to reach the people back there. I was talking about sonically, but I'm also talking about otherwise. And that will be demonstrated here. And that's the last thing I'm going to say. Uh oh. I'm glad I have two cell phones. Microphone on? Yes. Okay. Chris, uh, Mr. Johnson, we're not doing black and blue tomorrow night, are we? No, sir. Okay, cool. As a matter of fact, you can find this online. It's called Play. Play for somebody you love. about this regardless of where you are in your playing um, about I don't know 15 years ago a friend of mine uh, Lucius and I went to school with him he played um, tuba and baritone saxophone his name was uh, Keith he called me on the phone he played a cassette tape of me playing in high school I must have been about 15 or 16 maybe 17 I was like wow I say hey man I'll give you any amount of money to not play that for anybody <laughs> and and he gave me the tape, and about three weeks later, I listened to it. I was like, wait a minute, that's me. How can I be ashamed of who, you know, I am, uh, uh, you know, where I was? And it was like, I mean, you know, you think about Miles Davis, Louis Armstrong, Benny Goodman, Ella Fitzgerald. There was a time Ella couldn't sing, but she, she, she didn't come here like that. She had to work to get that way. There was a time that Miles Davis probably... You know, he couldn't play a major scale. Louis Armstrong couldn't, they, you know, it was a part of the process. And this story kind of speaks to that. And I was like, man, then I listened to it again. I was like, you know what? I'm not really ashamed of how I played because that's me. And that was a step in my process to getting uh, where I am, you know, during that time. And I said, and it sounds exactly like me. Then I, all of a sudden, even though I didn't really share with anybody, I was, was kind of proud of it. I was like, hey. Though that was, you know, A through J, and now I can play A through Z. Anyway, 
I said, I'm going to stop talking. All right, so this is, uh, every time I listen to this, I'm going to try to be slow. It's not easy to. Now, it's not easy to practice every day. It's not easy to have that positive attitude. And I learned something years ago from a great man named Louis Armstrong. In 1960, I was a member of the Dukes of Dixieland. And we had the opportunity to record with Louis Armstrong. That's one of the most important things that ever happened to me in my musical career. We were nervous, man. We were absolutely train wrecks about this recording. Because you see, in those days, if you made a mistake, you started all over again. You didn't splice tape like they do today. So each one of us was thinking, oh, Lord, if I make a mistake, let me make my mistake before Louis records his solo. Because if he records a solo and then I make a mistake and they got to throw it all out, he's not going to be too happy. And we're on the road, we're up in Toronto, and we're trying to find out what tunes Louis wants to play. And we don't hear anything from him at all. We just know that next week we're in New York playing at the round table during the night and recording with Louis during the day. Have you heard from Louis? No. Nope. Hope we know the tunes he wants to do. So we get into New York. And the second day we're there, we go to this studio, Webster Hall. We walk in and there's Louis sitting at a table. Everybody said hi and we all greeted each other. And we knew him. We'd known him and played opposite him in jazz festivals and then he looked at us, he said, Well, what you cats want to record? We said, well, we thought you'd have some tunes. And he said, no, I thought you'd have some tunes you want to do, you know. So we spent an hour discussing tunes, because if you record a tune for one company, you can't record it for another company for a period of years. And Louis would say, well, if you guys think you'd like to do uh, so-and-so, and his manager would say, Louis, you did that last year. You can't do it for this company. Oh, yeah, that's right. We finally came up with some tunes. So now we start recording. And Louis standing here with his trumpet. Clarinets over here. Trombones are here. I'm over here on tuba. Here's the drums. And I'm looking right at him. The first tune that Louis wants to do is a tune called Avalon. He said... Anybody know the words? Frank said, yeah, let's see. I met my love in Avalon beside the sea. He said, that's all I can think of. Louis said, that's all right, I'll make it. And we started playing Avalon, and Louis's wife was sitting behind him, just about where this young drummer is sitting. And behind her was an all-glass recording booth. So Lucille is sitting back there, and Louis starts singing. And there's this big wall here. He turns that wall into 10,000 people. He's looking and I'm looking at him and he's singing and he's looking at faces and recognizing people. I met Lucille in Avalon beside the sea and she's here with me today. And he's waving at people and laughing and like, how you doing? And then pointing to her and I'm flabbergasted. I can't believe it. We get done with that tune. What's the next tune? Just a closer walk with thee. And Mr. Armstrong folded his hands and put his, arm, his horn over here. And in that moment, he turned that place into a personal chapel. He looked up and he started talking to God. He said, just a closer walk with thee, O oh Lord. It's you and me. Nobody in the room but Louis and his God. It was absolutely frightening. And we got done with the first take. I'm standing there crying. I turn and look at the drummers crying. Clarinet players are crying. Trombones are crying. Lucille is crying, his own wife. And the engineer who was used to working with heavies. Earlier that day, he'd recorded Lena Horne and Billy Eckstein, so he wasn't intimidated by names. He came out intending to tell Louie 
that the first take was a good one and we wouldn't have to do it again. And he walked up to Louis, he looked him right in the face and had to turn away. He couldn't talk. And Louis picked up on it and he said, well, I think it's time we get some donuts and some coffee and we'll take a little break. And that broke the ice and we sat down at the table again and they sent a gopher out and got some sweets and all and stuff. And so we're sitting there. And for some reason, God gave me the moxie to talk to Louis at that point. I said, how do you do that? How is it that you turn it into an audience? You turn it into your own chapel. How do you do that? Get away from all the stuff that's bugging you in your mind about making mistakes and doing that. And he looked at me and he says, well, he says, I always play for somebody I love. That's all. You play for somebody you love all the time. He says, I always play for him because he gave me the talent. He says, I play for Lucille because she's my wife and I love her. And if I make some mistakes, she understands. He says, they all want to listen. That's cool. He said, if they don't want to listen, it's still cool because I was going to play for him and her anyway. And I thought, man, that is so hip, it's ridiculous. You don't walk out and worry about a judge if you're in a state contest. You don't worry about the size of an audience if they're going to like you. You walk out and you play every note for somebody you love. And you let them listen to it and witness it. And even if they weren't there... Half of them are gone. You play for somebody you love and you don't worry about anything else. Because you see, when you play for somebody you love, you automatically try to do the best you can. Because you love that person. If you remember anything from this week, this is what I want you to remember. You're special. God gave you an incredible gift. And he's watching you develop it. And you play for somebody you love every time you play your instrument. When you're practicing alone over the small group, over the big band, you play for somebody you love. You don't have to tell them who it is. But you try it. Believe me, man, it is one of the most important music lessons you'll ever want to get. I learned it from Louis Armstrong, and he did not lie to me. And that's all I want to say on the subject. Thank you very much. So, anyway, I'm going to close. I want to thank you all for coming to participate in the band. And I'm looking forward to playing with you, you ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow night and, um, and, and in the future. I don't travel as much as I used to. And actually, <laughs> for the school that I teach at, this is our you know, our spring break. And I was, I was just gonna keep it off, but I said, you know, Mr. Johnson called, I said, I, I told my manager, why you I'll, I'll go do it. So, and I'm glad to see what's going on. Cool. Well, thank you guys for having me. Let's do it on the bandstand tomorrow and uh, play and sing. You know, play for somebody you love. If you can do that, it it is a hip music lesson. So, thank you all for having me. I'll see you all tomorrow. Yeah, well,